Hello, everyone. My name is Vijay Narayanan. Welcome to the session on analyzing transactional data in Apache Droid. Okay, you can see my uh, PowerPoint. Slide show. <coughs> so just uh, briefly about myself, uh, I'm currently a solution engineer with uh, Impla. Uh, before this, I've been with uh, Cloudera, uh, Ordenworks, Cloudera, and then uh, before that uh, with Pintaho. I'm based in Bangalore, India, and um, relatively new to open source. Uh, been in open source for the last uh, five years, but uh, I have a total of about 18 years experience in the uh, data integration and analytics uh, area. So this session, I uh, will spend the first uh, about uh, five or 10 minutes on uh, introducing Apache Druid as a platform for uh, big data analytics, then talk about uh, what is transactional data in the context of this uh, session talk about uh, challenges in analyzing the uh, transactional data in Druid, uh, lay out a couple of approaches, and also then uh, focus on the benefits uh, that are to be had in analyzing uh, transactional data uh, in Druid. Druid was uh, invented to address a very specific problem that there is no uh, optimized real-time data store for uh, analyzing data in real-time and also uh, you know, analyzing data that is very fresh. So Druid combines a uh, number of different concepts and technologies. Uh, first is real-time streaming analytics, uh, multi-dimensional OLAP, combined with the scale-out storage and computing principles of Adobe. We shared nothing uh, distributed architecture and the ability to scale uh, based on uh, the size of the data and the uh, number of queries that are coming through. So Druid uh, sits at the intersection of a number of uh, uh, areas. Uh, one is uh, the ability to do search, uh, ad hoc queries based on uh, indexed data, time series uh, queries, and, and uh, pretty much uh, you know queries that give you sub-second end-to-end response time. So Druid basically sits at the intersection of OLAPs, time series database, and search engines. If you think of uh, the digital consumer today, uh, there are a number of characteristics that are driving the need for extremely uh, real-time analytics, uh, which is also usable by uh, all personas. Right? So first is um, the uh, digital consumer. Uh, I, as a digital consumer, I know that uh, my world creates a lot of data. Um, I have lots of applications of different devices and all of them are constantly creating data and I need to be able to analyze that data. Now, as a buyer of products, I of course uh, also know that if uh, you know one online store does not satisfy my requirements, does not have what I want, I can always right away jump over to another store. So the ability to uh, satisfy, the, I mean, know the customer's requirements and satisfy them in real time is quite critical. And of course, uh, the consumer is pretty aware uh, Everybody these days know that data is very powerful uh, and any limitations on how um, I use my data can lead to all kinds of interesting uh, concerns, including, uh, you know, about liberty, about uh, privacy and stuff like that. And lastly, um, you know, as a, a consumer of data, I want to use um, data in a very... Uh, uh, <clears throat> in newer and uh, more instinctive ways to make decisions. Right? I want to be able to use data that is coming in today, uh, look at data that's there in the past, look at patterns from the past, see the patterns from today, and so on. So all these things lead to some interesting uh, requirements for a tool that aims to allow uh, consumers, uh, data consumers, to uh, work in this new world of data. First is, uh, you know, data consumers need the complete picture. This essentially refers to scale where, uh, you know, we need to be able to analyze uh, petabytes of data with large amount of concurrency so that all users can look at the data from their own perspective. And data needs to be refreshed frequently. It needs to flow in fast, often uh, terabytes per day. Um, 
users are looking for a conversational experience. What that means is that I don't want to uh, run a query and go away and have a cup of coffee and come back. I would like to uh, do things in such a way that I run a query, I get an immediate response, and based on that, I run another query and so on. So we need an interactive conversational experience with the data. I also don't want uh, lots of pre-built dashboards which sort of restrict my view of the data. I would like to analyze the data in a very ad hoc manner and do arbitrary slicing and dicing. So I need data in great granularity. And there is no point having a lot of pre-aggregates, pre-aggregated data, because what aggregate I need, I won't know until I begin the analysis. And I want a user interface that is very responsive. So all these um, requirements translate into some key technical concepts. Uh, I want real-time event-based platform, which uh, actually which is very relevant for our current problem of analyzing transaction data. As we will see, uh, transactions are simply made up of multiple events and uh, a platform that stores events in time has certain unique challenges in analyzing uh, uh, that kind of data. I want a platform that can deal with large volumes of valuable data. Uh, a platform that ingests primarily uh, cleansed, enriched, joined, and normalized data. Data that has uh, multiple dimensions. And lastly, the ability to create different uh, uh, types of metrics uh, with different types of statistics. Druid is a platform that is built, being built in keeping all these requirements in mind. So uh, Druid is used by consumers uh, through many different means. Um, consumers who want to make decisions based on descriptive analytics, on statistics, use tools like uh, Implied Pivot, Looker, Tableau, Superset, and so on. Uh, consumers who want to put together their, their own UI, um, you know, have a custom front-end experience for their customers. Uh, they want to, uh, they use uh, tools or frameworks like React or Angular uh, and so on. And lastly, there are data scientists who would like to use uh, a platform like Druid, uh, primarily because, uh, you know, uh, often uh, generating training data from a petabyte scale uh, warehouse is very difficult and very time consuming. So often uh, data scientists find that, uh, you know, with the data lake on one side and with the uh, customer on the other, they are constrained in actual uh, machine learning they can do because it's taking a long time to fetch the data from the lake and feed the models. So Druid will also help in that. So Druid uh, brings two things uh, together, uh, business intelligence and real-time intelligence. You can see some of the differences here. Uh, business intelligence is about uh, function-based analytics, while real-time intelligence is more performance-focused. How soon can I do things? Uh, business intelligence usually uses tools that are for analysts to use, while real-time intelligence tries to democratize this so that and make uh, consumption tools available to the entire organization. With uh, business intelligence, you're often trying to answer what is happening now. With real-time intelligence, you would like to know what has happened in the past and also what is happening in the recent past and almost up to now. Right. And with real time intelligence, you want to have um, often it is information is served on a schedule, while business intelligent is, uh, you know, trying to do ad hoc things with the data. Right. So these are some of the differences between real time intelligence and business intelligence. And Druid sits at the conjunction of these two um, capabilities and concepts. Uh, business intelligence, which usually traditionally depended on data lakes, data warehouses, hive. Um, for example, or even going back, um, you know, your Metisas uh, and Verticas and legacy systems, uh, data lakes like uh, your blob stores, and then Event Hub. So Druid um, sits in this conjunction of real time and business intelligence. The mission of Druid is to make data more accessible to more audiences. So traditionally, analysts ran reports and answered questions from business guys. But with a platform like Druid, it's much more easier to allow the business guys to 
uh, start using the data directly is depending on a team of analysts. The speed of querying in Druid allows uh, users to sort of focus on their curiosity rather than just focusing on a, a template analytics. This is absolutely important to uh, get what I call what I would think of as serendipitous uh, insights, so insights that happen by uh, accident. And Druid allows combine, combining uh, real time and historical uh, data. This allows uh, us to tell the whole story and finally uh, get new data to decision makers faster. So if my uh, CEO is sitting and looking at a dashboard, uh, uh, you know, uh, a report, and it is taking many uh, minutes or even seconds to load. Uh, that's not a good state of things. You want all that to happen uh, sub-second, and that's what Druid is very good at. So um, <clears throat> Druid brings about uh, the ability to democratize analytics and to accelerate adaptation of an organization to changing circumstances, which are revealed in changing patterns in the data. Okay, so where does Druid fit in the broader uh, pipeline, data processing pipeline? So if you think of the pipeline as something where data is produced at an application, it is delivered uh, using uh, small tools like uh, Amazon Kinesis or Apache Kafka, brought and processed in things like uh, Spark or Hive, and then stored in a variety of systems, uh, HDFS, uh, MySQL, uh, HPS, and so on, and finally queried and then delivered. The querying is where uh, Druid fits in. <clears throat> querying is all about uh, slicing and dicing the data, doing ad hoc metrics, uh, using uh, ad hoc statistical calculations. This is where Druid fits into the whole uh, pipeline. Okay. So this is a brief uh, overview of the Druid architecture. So I'm not going to drill into uh, Druid architecture uh, in this session. There have been other sessions uh, in this track focused on some of the aspects of Druid architecture. The Druid has a typical uh, distributed uh, big data architecture uh, with uh, master nodes, data nodes, and query nodes. Data nodes store uh, data in a partitioned uh, fashion, uh, primarily partitioned by time, but it can be uh, partitioned by other uh, you know, dimensions also. And uh, the data is also indexed, bitmap index, string feeds a bitmap index, so that searches are very fast. And some of the data can be in memory and some of the data in, can be in disk. So Druid uses uh, memory mapped files to handle the data that is on which queries are being run. So depending on what data is going to be used by a particular query, it can get paged in and out of memory depending on how much memory is available. Now, the query nodes in Druid actually bring in the queries and choose which data nodes the queries will go to depending on the time period in the query. So, and they also uh, support uh, uh, you know, various interfaces like SQL, JDBC, REST API, and so on. The master nodes coordinate the whole thing. Uh, they manage the multiple uh, tasks that are ingesting data either from real-time streams like Kafka or from batch sources like HDFS, uh, blob storage, and so on. And they also distribute, they also manage the task of distributing the data in the data nodes so that queries are, uh, you know, balanced out and query performance is optimal. And there is a metadata database that stores uh, usually MySQL or Postgres, which actually stores the metadata about the data that is sitting in the data node. And all this is coordinated by uh, Zookeeper. This allows, this architecture allow, is highly optimized and the, the data the format in which data is written in Druid is highly optimized for query execution. And this is one of the primary reasons why uh, Druid is so high performant in query execution. The key thing to note in this architecture is that data that is once written into Druid is immutable. So there is no updating of the data. Although data, some data can be deleted, that process is not uh, you know, as simple as in other systems where you can just run a delete uh, query in SQL. Uh, with Druid, that's not as simple. So updating data is uh, not supported. Data that is written into Druid tends to be immutable. So this takes us to the uh, question of what is transactional data and what are the issues around handling it in Druid and what are the benefits that you can get by storing transactional data in Druid? Now, the way I think about transactional data is data that actually changes around the primary key. So it could be customers who go through various stages on my website, or it could be a user who's visiting my website and visits a number of different pages. 
or it could be payment data where you know but, uh, payments are first created payments are completed and sometimes even cancelled because with the uh, modern uh, you know the um, uh, with the online retail uh, often when uh, you know when uh, so customers choose to return something they purchased then the payment gets cancelled or refunded so customers payments can go through multiple stages in this world so um, data that has is updates happening around the primary key or data that is sessionized uh, with a session starting at one point and session going in users i mean the data going through various stages within the session and the session finishing right so these are the kinds of data that i think of as transactional in this context of this session okay so this is an example of uh, transactional data from a uh, online payments uh, type of use case where you have uh, data uh, that is coming in in time uh, each um, record has a transaction id which is essentially the primary key as far as this data is concerned and it goes through a number and all the other columns go through a number of uh, changes for example status can be pre created paid and then cancelled uh, like when a user makes a payment and decides to return that uh, whatever they purchased and hence the payment gets either cancelled or refunded and then there can be a reason for cancelling and then there are methods of payment and uh, you know you could have a, a channel of payment and also the amount of payment so this is a typical uh, uh, transactional data in uh, you know retail finance online retail finance type of situation and in general in traditional systems this would have collapsed into this because traditional system would update the data based on a primary key so that at any one point any point a particular transaction id as essentially one uh, record. Now the same type of pattern also shows up, for example, in uh, in this case, some kind of a fitness application, which is tracking, uh, you know, when a person starts walking, uh, it is actually tracking the distance and also the stages, uh, you know, for example, getting ready to walk, about to walk, walking, finishing walking and done. So this potentially could be stages that a user goes through and each stage is an event and all the events are being captured. Again, in traditional systems, you would end up with one final record for that user, which gives you the final or at least the current status of that user, depending on what time uh, the data is being um, looked at. Right? So the challenge in Druid is that this approach of updating based on some primary key is not possible in Druid because Druid does not support updates and Druid does not have a primary key. Right? So in traditional systems, each primary key will have only one row at any given time. So you can query, uh, you know, for example, if you were to query uh, for a transaction where status equal to paid, it will give you all the transactions that are currently in status equal to pay. Now, because Druid does not actually support updates on primary keys, this is not possible uh, in uh, Druid. And what uh, happens when you look for, um, you know, transaction with status equal to pay, it will also get you a transaction where the customer moved from paid to cancel, right? So it will get you those transactions where that status exists somewhere in the transaction history. Uh, not necessarily the current, um, you know, uh, uh, status of the transaction. Right. So because Druid is an event system, uh, it captures events, and obviously events are happening in time, and it captures all the events, um, you know, uh, documenting essentially the entire journey of that uh, entity, whether it be a customer or a transaction or just an event. It documents the entire journey of that entity. Now, how do we deal with this kind of data in? Uh, Druid. So again, traditionally, um, you know, systems could have uh, two kind of tables, say transaction and then transaction history, and then join it uh, when the query is done. Again, um, doing that is not possible in Druid because uh, with Druid, the idea is you don't use a lot of joins. Joins are, uh, you know, definitely affect performance in all systems, and hence uh, Druid does not support an extensive set of joins. So doing joins is not a very good option if you want to get query results in less than one second. So there are two ways of dealing with this in Druid. One is to use this uh, latest, earliest, and any value SQL constructs. So these are some interesting uh, SQL constructs that uh, Druid, it's probably unique to Druid. Uh, for example, latest gets you the latest value of a column by time. So in, if you take this data and look at this, uh, this query where I'm selecting the transaction ID and the latest status, 
And I'm also grouping by the transaction ID. So the latest actually treats that string field as an aggregate, and it essentially sorts that field and gets you the latest value by time. So if I were to run this query on this data I'm showing here, then pretty much I will get this, where for the transaction ID one, I will get the latest status, which is obviously paid. For transaction ID two, I will get the latest status, which is canceled. And transaction ID three is got only one status, which is created, right? So it gets you the latest status in time for that particular uh, event. In a similar way, uh, you could you could deal with any uh, uh, you know any of the dimensions, the attributes in this way. It is applicable to all columns in the um, in the uh, uh, table. Uh, it's applicable to numeric columns and string columns. It deals with the uh, earliest or the latest, essentially in aggregate, where the data is sorted and you get the latest or the earliest, depending on what um, uh, what the uh, SQL construct is. But of course, uh, you can also use any value if there are, for example, the amount doesn't change. So I could use uh, any value on the amount here. Channel doesn't change. So pretty much any value can be used uh, for those columns where your value is not changing. Right? So this is kind of how um, one mechanism. So using this approach, what you can do is uh, you can write a query like this to get the latter status. And then uh, uh, you know you can then uh, count that uh, count that uh, uh, number of transactions where the latter status is essentially equal to paid. So you can see I'm using a group by query, and the filter is being done on the aggregate by using this um, uh, the having uh, keyword, which allows us to filter on the aggregate values, and this will give me all the transactions which have the latest status as paid. Right. So this is one mechanism of handling uh, this kind of data and rule, which is fairly uh, reasonably performant compared to other approaches uh, using some kind of join or uh, trying to do self join with the same table. Those approaches tend to really ruin performance, but this approach is fairly uh, high performant. Another mechanism which is often more effective from a performance perspective is using a Kafka lookup. So in Druid, a lookup is a concept where using a key, we can uh, you know, do a lookup against a key value, a table contains keys and values, and that would essentially return the value uh, for that key, right? So this allows us to uh, treat, um, you know, allows us to have the latest uh, time for each transaction in uh, Kafka, do a lookup on that, so that you can uh, retrieve the latest uh, time for each transaction and use that to filter the primary table. And that will essentially give us uh, what we need, uh, essentially running a query like this, where I'm filtering here, uh, doing a lookup on the transaction ID, which will get me the latest time for that transaction. And then I'm using that to filter on the primary table so that uh, I can retrieve only those uh, uh, transactions where uh, which are for the latest time for that transaction ID. Now, this query may not actually directly run on Druid because it may require some additional formatting since the lookup will have a time in string field, while the underlying time field in Druid is a uh, uh, timestamp, uh, epoch time, uh, millisecond timestamp. So that, uh, you, know, you know, there's some additional formatting required, but the concept is that we use the lookup to essentially get the latest time. So when you're populating, uh, when I'm populating data, from Kafka into in just into Druid, I will have two topics. One is a primary topic where I get all my data. The other one is just a uh, Kafka lookup topic where I will get only the current time for uh, each transaction. And this allows me to uh, essentially, uh, you know, uh, get the latest. Uh, and if I need the earliest, of course, I can also notice. The, I mean, use another Kafka lookup with the first time for each transaction and so on. This is extremely high performant in uh, with reasonable size data sets. With this kind of approach, it's very easy to reach uh, a, a performance time of less than a second. And uh, a few of the thoughts on lookups in Druid. Lookups in Druid are uh, extremely high performant. The Druid uh, engine is optimized, highly optimized to use lookups for queries. And lookups are stored in all the data nodes and also the query nodes in Druid. And thus, uh, there is no runtime broadcasting of the lookup. And this is the reason why uh, lookups perform extremely well in Druid. And lookups are stored both on heap and also as memory map files. So the size of the lookup is not restricted and you can use very, I mean, fairly large size lookup to handle many use cases. Now that we have seen um, 
what are the uh, ways of handling what I would think of as traditional analytics in on transactional data in Druid, what more can you do with transactional data or event data or sessionized data if you come to think of in Druid? One approach is to use uh, funnel analytics to understand uh, how users are transitioning uh, from one stage to another. Now, in Druid, funnel analytics for uh, scenarios where the funnel stages are pretty much fixed uh, and users cannot go from, say, A to C and then come back to B. Right? Druid does not support that kind of funnel where the user's uh, stage can arbitrarily change. Uh, the primary way of looking at funnels in Druid is a fixed transition. I come to A, now I can only go to B, and I can only go to C from there, and I can only go to D from there uh, as a user. And this is uh, often true in many uh, use cases where the user, especially in uh, financial uh, payment applications, for example, uh, you know, uh, payment app or uh, you know, use cases like that, where the, the stages the customer goes through are fixed. Now there are uh, other use cases where the stages are not fixed, like uh, generally having a website where the user can browse anything they want, where the stages are really not fixed. And it's difficult to use this kind of uh, approach in those cases. This primarily applies to um, you know, scenarios where the stages are fixed. So if you think of uh, a data like this, where the user actually uh, goes through one or all the stages uh, as a given here user one goes through a b c in sequence user two is just on a user three is gone through uh, you know uh, again uh, a b c in sequence and user four is just on c uh, now of course in this particular uh, example the users are able to uh, uh, although this example uh, kind of gives you uh, stages where the users are going through um, different stages, the order cannot be switched. As I said earlier, they could come directly to B or C, but they cannot switch the order. That's the whole point of this uh, uh, approach. Now, the requirement often is to uh, find out uh, the uh, set of users, count of the set of users who went through all two stages, like A into section B to section C, or just A into section B, or B into section C, or A into section C. Uh, this is very useful in, uh, um, you know, an understanding user behavior and, uh, uh, you know, essentially marketing to users. Um, so, for example, if you think of uh, an online uh, OTT type platform, uh, you are interested in, uh, uh, you know, noting uh, which user watched uh, series uh, A versus uh, series B of a particular, uh, you know, program or, uh, a, you know, program in one language versus another language. There, the ordering doesn't matter. What matters is, uh, is the user watching both those or uh, any number of those programs or series so that uh, you can decide on uh, 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 things like what is the market size for all these things together, uh, you know, and then also try to target uh, marketing in different geographies uh, based on the audience preferences. So that's where uh, this sort of analytics is very useful, where the sequence in which the users went through things is not uh, important, is not critical. Okay, so this kind of uh, uh, analytics can be done using uh, what are called theta sketches in Druid. So I've given you a query here where I'm doing an intersection. So I have user going through. So first, there is the inner query where I'm selecting users where state is A, computing a theta sketch. Uh, state is B, again, computing a theta sketch. And state is C, computing another theta sketch. And then uh, on the higher level query, I'm doing an intersect of all these three data sketches, and that will give me A intersection, B intersection, C. So this uh, using data sketches with this kind of analytics is pretty much the only way of doing this in real time. So where I to use a brute force SQL query to actually compute this count in real time, the performance really will not be uh, good enough to actually do it in real time. Okay, so to summarize, uh, Transaction data is kind of data that changes continuously for a primary key. So you can think of it as transaction data, since sessionized data, um, you know, uh, event data. So number of ways of uh, uh, number of terms to be used for that. Now, because Druid changes stores each change rather than just the final state, doing traditional analytics in Druid on this kind of data is complicated and uh, can be done using a couple of approaches which are laid out in this uh, presentation. Uh, use the uh, latest, earliest, and any value SQL constructs. 
And also uh, the second approach is using a Kafka lookup to capture the latest time for a session or a transaction and use that to filter out the primary table. Now, because Druid actually stores all events, it opens the field for a lot of different interesting analytics. Uh, this particular session talked about how you can use data sketches to do the intersection of the stages a user passes through uh, on their way uh, to the, uh, you know, uh, to their final uh, journey with that with that application. Uh, so I hope uh, this session was uh, useful and give you some ideas on how you can use Druid. Uh, thank you, and I am uh, open to any question.